Looking at example 3.2, what the authors have done is they've extended the example in 3.1 to now include two different labor lines. So you've got testing labor on line 1 and testing labor on line 2, which include different costs. They've got a cost per labor hour for assembly, which is still $11, a cost per labor hour for testing on line 1 at $19, and a cost per labor hour for testing on line 2 at $17. Notice here, again, we're keeping the inputs toward the top left of this model, and it really wasn't much to add an extra labor cost here. Now, our inputs for assembling and testing a computer, we can have more than two models. Rather than the XP and the basic, we've got model 1 all the way through model 8. We can put in the labor hours for assembly for each of these models, and in this case, we just specify them here. Notice they don't even have to be integers. We've got 5.5 .5 here, or 5.5 .5 here. Our labor hours could be an hour and a half, right? We've got 1.5 here, or two and a half hours, we've got 2.5 here. Our labor hours on our second line are listed here. Our cost for each component part is here. We could add additional direct material lines if we wanted to here as well. We've got our selling price for each unit over here. And then our unit margin for testing on line one is calculated by taking B$13, dollar sign and we can't use named ranges here because we want to be able to drag this formula across, but B$13, dollar sign and that's referring to our selling price, minus dollar sign B$, dollar sign and that's our cost per labor hour of assembly, times the number of hours we use in assembly, and that is in cell B9. Here we're going to leave B unlocked, we don't keep a dollar sign in front of the B, but we'll make 9 an absolute reference. We don't want the 9 to change as we drag this formula, but we do want the B to change as we drag across. Minus dollar sign B4. Now we want the 4 to change when we move to the next row. We're going to copy this formula down for line 2, and you'll notice that line 2 lies one line below line 1. So we want that 4 to change to a 5, but we don't want that column B to change away from column B, we want that to stay as column B as we drag this across. Times B10 minus B dollar sign 12, and again for the same reason that we had before, we want the B to change as we drag this across, we don't want the 12 to change. Now when we commit this, we can just click the checkbox or hit enter, and we drag this across, our formula adapts automatically. When we drag this down, our formula adapts automatically. And take a couple of seconds to look at how that has changed. Even though we're here, now all of these things refer to this column, whereas all of these continue to refer to this column. Similarly, on the next line, these remain pointing at the same cells that we wanted them to. But notice, because we left this cell unlocked, it has now moved from the $19 to the $17. So it really wasn't a lot of extra work to extend this model now to multiple different lines, multiple different models, and make this a lot more complicated. Just to be clear, I'm not going to test you on anything this complicated, but I wanted to show you what it looks like to set up a model that was a lot more complicated than the one we did in class. Now our production plan, our decision variables, would be the number to test on line 1 and on line 2. And we can drag those out. Our total number of computers produced are here. We've got a maximum sales constraint here. To calculate our hours used, we take the sum product of B19 to I19 this time, together with the total number of computers produced. For testing, we do this on a line-by-line -line basis. It's the sum product of B10 to I10, and then the number tested on line 1. And then finally, the labor hours for testing on line 2, we take the sum product of B11 to I11 and the number tested on line 2. We can finally add all of this up. Now we do this on a model by model basis, and we can go across to see what that has done. We can add it up, and then take our grand total to get 615,813. We could run this through Solver and see what our ideal number of computers to test and produce would be. And again, it's a much more complicated example, but as you notice, I hope, it really isn't that much more complicated to set up once you've set up your basic model the right way. I encourage you guys to save these spreadsheets. I encourage you guys to keep a record of how we've set each of these things up 
So when you're working in the real world, if you need to come back and have a reference, you could do that.